Good morning, friends. Welcome to Glen Hope Baptist Church today. My name is Louis Baber, along with Kevin Brown. We are the pastors here. I want to extend a special welcome to guests that are here today. I know we have several guests here for our graduates this morning that we're recognizing. If there are other guests, this is your first time here and not related to um, a graduate this morning, we're, we're, we're super glad to have you here. We're super glad to have everyone here. But uh, we invite you to check out our Welcome Center uh, after the service is over today and grab a, a gift bag that we have for you. One of our members will certainly walk you down and make sure you get that. Um, do want to take some time to go over some announcements and reminders for you. Um, also let you know, you know, normally I'm going around talking to you, interacting with you and whatnot, and not doing that today because um, the only thing that stands between Kim and her final cancer surgery on Wednesday is her not getting COVID between now and then. So I'm staying away from you as much as I can so that that can uh, hopefully happen on Wednesday. So um, I'm not being mean or not being different. I guess I am being different, but not being standoff. It's just trying to protect all that. So announcements. Um, ladies have a Bible study. We've been talking about that starting on July 3rd. Certainly want to encourage all of our ladies to consider being a part of that. Take you a little bit deeper in your walk with, with the Lord over those few weeks that that Bible study is going on. Uh, Tuesday morning, we're hosting Broadview's 8th grade graduation. We can use as many hands as possible. Please consider volunteering for that. It starts at 9.30, so if you want to be here to help direct people, uh, you need to be here about 9 o'clock. Uh, we're going to do a reception afterwards. If you'd like to, uh, if you're only looking to help with that, then be here about 9.45 to help with some of the setup for that. So Tuesday morning with that collecting items for backpacks that we're going to be giving away on National Night Out on August 2nd uh, to kids in the community. Uh, you can see the items that we need there. Senior Bible study is not going to meet this Tuesday, so that frees you up to volunteer on Tuesday if you can. Um, later on this month, I want to go ahead and let you know about a couple of opportunities uh, before I'm out next Sunday, um, just so you can um, hear it from me on June 22nd, that's a Wednesday, we're going to do a free car wash here at the church, um, and, that's, and it's legitimately free, it's not one of those uh, bait and switch type things, right, people hold up a free car wash and then they want a donation. No, this is totally free, uh, we're, we're, we want to have people driving through, swing in and get their car washed, um, just like the love of Jesus is free, we want to wash their cars for free, and hopefully be able to have some gospel conversations with people. So hopefully you can plan to, to be here that night to help with the car wash, to help with gospel conversations. And then just two nights later, on June 24th, we'll be having our, our first summer community night with hamburgers, hot dogs, bounce houses, games, just a, a fun time. Any of you were, were out last year when we did those throughout the summer and recognize the, the good time we had with that, uh, just a, a laid-back time to a fellowship with each other, but fellowship with, with folks in the community right around the church. People, it's a time for you to invite people from your neighborhood, people from your work, just come out. It's just a, a good time to come out and hopefully opens the doors for gospel conversations with people as well. So have those things on your calendar. Speaking of that, we do have down front here the on either side, these uh, neon uh, calendars for the summer. June, July on one side, August on the other. Grab one of those, take it home so you can uh, keep track of what's going on throughout the summer. Put it on your refrigerator uh, so you can keep track of that. Also down front, we'll have these for the next few weeks. We have flyers for our community night. So you can grab those and pass them out to people, hang them up in different places. Um, English on one side. Spanish on the other, so you're covered with maybe not all of your bases of people that you know, but a lot of the bases uh, with people you know uh, with the language there. This Wednesday night, prayer walking at 6.30, uh, so please come on out and, and, and prepare to walk through the neighborhood praying and 
looking to engage in, in gospel conversations on Wednesday night at 6.30. Also Wednesday at 6.30, uh, teens, parents and teens that are going to camp, uh, which is next Monday, by the way. Um, What's that, 13th? Come on out for your final preparation uh, for camp. So that'll be going on this Wednesday, 6.30, for our teens that are heading to camp. Come out and get your fi- make your last-minute preparations for that. Um, and then Vermont Mission Team meeting. If you're interested in going to Vermont in the fall, there'll be a meeting this coming Thursday, 7 p.m. in the conference room. So a lot of things to cover there. Uh, for you this morning, but uh, luckily you have it all written down and you can keep track of it. So now we're going to switch gears and prepare for our graduate recognition service. You might want to, we got a good group of kindergarten graduates, these boys. I'm guessing you might not want to miss their march down. (laughs) So as soon as Miss Cindy's ready, she'll start playing and we'll see what they do. Let's get it done. Not what I thought. Eli, you kept him dignified. (laughs) Excellent, excellent work. So we see, friends, we have three kindergarten graduates and a college graduate that we are recognizing today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them here and give them some some gifts that we have for them. And so you guys get to stay up here um, the whole time, okay? And then when, we're, then when I pray for you, then you can head back. But it'll be worth it because I got gifts for you. Cool? All right. I don't know. Are we, do we have any type of order? Yeah. Is it like this that Sherry gave me? Close. All right. Christopher Darden. Christopher, yes. Stand, come stand over here so everybody can see you, Christopher. Over here, over here. Kind of like that. Excellent. Christopher Darden, six years old, child of Lee and Heather. His brother is Michael. Yeah, you can come on over, Michael. That's cool. (laughs) Grandparents, Jerry and Penny Compton, Steve Darden, and the late Kim Darden. Uh, Christopher graduated in kindergarten from Sylvan Elementary School, and he is announcing now that he plans to continue his education (laughs) at Sylvan Elementary School next year. His favorite food, chicken nuggets, corn dogs, and hot dogs. And corny dogs. And corny dogs, dogs, yes, corny dogs. I like the same thing. That's not what this says. I like pizza and the thing that he likes. Cool, excellent. I like pizza and anything else. That's very cool. But the thing I'm not liking. So it wasn't the walk down where the action was. Now, Christopher's favorite Bible story is about Adam and Eve. Excellent. So, Christopher, I have for you a little fun gift there. Wait till you, you got to wait to open it till your mom says it's okay. All right. And then another little Bible type gift here. And then we have some gummies. Excellent. All right, now, Michael, it's your time. Michael is also six years old, also has the same parents, believe it or not. Lee and Heather Darden, brother to Christopher. You want to go give that to your mom? All right. Be careful. He's also graduating from Sylvan Elementary and plans to continue there next year for first grade. It says here that your favorite food is mac and cheese. Do you agree? Yeah, and I like PK pizza and hot dog, corny dog, and corn dog. Well, sir, it's a bigger list. 
Excellent. It says your favorite Bible story is about Jesus dying on the cross. That's it. Excellent. Guess what? I have for you a fun gift. What? A Bible type gift. Hold on, let's do it this way. And gummies. Yay! Excellent. That's a good idea. All right. You have a question, Christopher? The big one, that's for Eli. Yeah. All right. Jameson, come over here, man. Yes, yes. This is Jameson Michael Hodge. Parents are Michelle Johnson and Rocky and Rebecca Hodge. Um, sibling, you have a baby brother coming. How about that? That's going to be good, isn't it? What do you want to name him? Wasn't it like a video game name or something? Oh, he forgot. All right. This is your day anyway, right? Grandparents, Linda Warren, Sherry Simmons, Eddie Hodge, Randy and Pam Thompson. Jameson is graduating kindergarten from Haw River Elementary, and he too intends to continue his education next year. First grade, big deal at Haw River. Favorite food? says, ice cream and popsicles. My goodness. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Cool. And your favorite Bible story is about Adam and, Adam and Eve in the garden. Very cool. So for you, my friend, we have a fun gift, a Bible-type gift, and gummies. Cool. You want to go give those? Excellent. Eli, come on over. You want to jump around or anything? When did you, how old were you when you started coming to this church, Eli? I don't think I was even at a mom yet. <laughs> All your life? All my life. All your life you've been here. Guys, this is cool. Very cool. I haven't been here all your life, so I didn't know. But very cool. Um, so Eli is the son of Alan and Margaret Hughes. Uh, Laura is his sister. There's Laura. Grandparents, Charlie and Madge Munger, Danny and Judy Hughes. Eli graduated. You graduated in December? When did you graduate? I walked in December. I graduated last summer. Okay. UNCG cum laude graduate, uh, Bachelor of Science in Business and Management. And why don't you tell us about your plans? Very cool. Excellent. Auto body business. Good stuff. So we have for you a big Bible because you can't have enough Bibles, right? And so we got a, a big Bible. I took away the su suspense of opening it um, because we certainly we want to communicate the message that study of God's Word is the most important thing to carry through your life. Um, so I uh, want to encourage you in that. But also because there's a bit of kid in everyone, you get gummies too. Yes, sir. Fellas, come back. Come back for one minute. Come stand over here with Eli. Just come stand... This way, if anyone wants to get more pictures, they can get more pictures with the whole group, okay? And I'm going to pray for you guys, okay? So let's pray together. Father God, uh, we're grateful that uh, we have these boys and this, this, this young man in, in, in the lives of everyone here. We're grateful, God, that uh, with the, these younger boys, we've seen them for all of their lives, basically. Eli, we've seen him. Um, those that have been blessed to be here all of his life have seen him, God. And we've seen them, seen Eli grow from a baby to, to a man. And uh, we want to pray, God, that he will continue to grow as a man of God that brings you glory in all he does. 
We pray, God, that Michael and Christopher and Jameson will be able to, to see an example in, in, a, in a man like Eli and, and grow along the same path in as much as it is a path that honors you and sees them grow into disciples of Jesus that bring glory to you in every way. We pray, God, that uh, as they go through uh, the, the rest of their lives, whatever seasons they're in, that we as a church body will walk with them in that, that we will support them and, and help them to grow as disciples. We celebrate them today, and in as much as we celebrate them, we celebrate you and in in, in your role and presence in their lives. And pray, God, that you will bless them so that they can honor you and bless you with their lives from here on. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Congratulations, guys. All right. You can head on out. Head back to your seats. Excellent. And at this time, as Pam Thompson is going to come up, we have a, a special Awanas Award to present. And then after that, Pastor Kevin will bring our call to worship. Okay, good morning. Um, we thought it was fitting that we do this this morning since we're focusing on students and um, the accomplishments. And it's not lost on me that um, the three kindergartners that were up here started Awanas with Eli as their, one of their leaders. And so it goes full circle. It really does matter. Um, but today it's about, um, those of you who don't know m much about the Awana program, when they start as Sparks, Everybody starts out in the same book, and it builds on the next book and the next book. So the goal is after three years of uh, Sparks, they will finish three books, which every book is packed full of Bible verses that they have to memorize. So we really think it's a big deal. All through the year, kids earn rewards. We give out rewards to everybody that works hard, and everybody works hard. But when they get to this point, it is... It is um, we feel like they need to be before you, so you can see you've been praying for them. And so I'm going to ask Evelyn Beers to come up here. And early in this year, she finished, she finished her, her third Sparky book. And so she's been reviewing for the past three months, but she... It's been wanting this, and I said, just wait, just wait. We're going to do it, I promise. So she has earned the Sparks Award, Sparky Award. So she gets a plaque. And then she gets a little pin that she can put on her vest. So congratulations to Evelyn for her hard work. And she'll be moving up to TNTs in the fall, so... And we'll be recruiting new leaders because you see it really works. It really pays off. Thanks. Good morning. Our call to worship today has come from Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. At this passage, Jesus is speaking with his disciples, and he's asking them some questions. Um, and we'll see Peter's response to him, because Peter seems to always have a response to him. So Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13, it says, Now when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He said to them, But who do you yourselves say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so what we see here is that Jesus hangs two questions in the air, and he's waiting for answers. The first one is, Who do people say that I am? Most of the people here said that he was some sort of a prophet or one of the Old Testament prophets returned from old. But who do people in air day 
say that Jesus is. According to the teenagers in our church, people say that Jesus was just a man, that Jesus was fake, that Jesus is just some lowercase g God among other gods, that Jesus is deistic, meaning that he was there when they kind of set things into motion, and then he's pulled away. He has nothing to do with this now. People say that Jesus is unloving. People say that Jesus was just a good teacher, and a lot of people say that Jesus was a historical figure. And so all sorts of people in our world have different things that they say about Jesus. But the more important question that he sends towards us that is hanging in there this morning is, who do you say that I am? Personally, who do you say that Jesus is? How you answer that question is going to determine how you're going to enter into worship this morning. If he's just a good teacher, you might listen out for some of the things um, that he has to say, and you'll pick and choose what you want to accept. If Jesus is just a man, you're not really going to be inclined to worship him very much at all because he's no different than any dude you're going to run into at the Walmart. But if Jesus is God, if Jesus is the Christ, if Jesus is the Son of the living God, if Jesus is the Lamb who was slain so that we might be saved, if Jesus is both your Savior and your Lord, you're going to worship him. And so let that question ring through your mind this morning as we get ready to enter into worship. Who do you say that Jesus is? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, for the opportunity to come and worship you. We thank you for sending Jesus to live the perfect life that none of us could live, to die a atoning death for us on the cross, to rise from the dead, defeating sin and death so that we can be forgiven and have life with you eternally. Help us to fully grasp what Jesus has done for us. And from the thankfulness that overflows from that, help us to worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Battery's dead. Good morning, church. As we worship this morning, uh, this first song is just, it's a cry of our hearts that God would open up the heavens and show us his glory. So as we worship, make that your prayer this morning, that God would come and meet with us today and reveal himself to us. Let's stand and worship together. Show us your glory, show us, 
next song reminds me of how much we need God, how much that we, re we should rely on him for every day that we have, every breath that we take, every single thing that we do, how much we need him every moment.
As our ushers have come forward, I want to remind you that, hold on fellas, I'm going to pray before you head out, right. that as we, as we give this morning, that uh, this is an opportunity for you to give. If you've already given online or through text to give, this is an opportunity to reflect on your giving and pray about how you'll give next time. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for the opportunity to worship you in and through our giving. Grateful, Father, that uh, we can use this time to, to understand that what we give is not even ours. It's yours. You've made us, you've given us stewardship over what is yours. I pray, God, that our eyes open more and more to understanding what that means and, and applying that truth in our lives, that, that it's yours. And uh, what, we, what we do with what is yours is important. So God, I pray that, uh, that we grow with, with more intentionality about what we give and how we give it and, and thinking about what and how we give. The intentionality, God, to give you glory in our giving. God, we use this time to, to thank you for giving us the opportunity to give giving us the opportunity, God, to, to recognize your provision in our lives, to worship you in response to it by giving back to you. So God, I pray that our motives are right, and that our giving is appropriate as a measure of who you are in our lives. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Good morning. So I was asked to pray for our graduates today, and um, it's really special because I got the privilege of working with the little boys for Awanas, and then I am blessed to be Eli's mom. But I will say, when Eli was here, and it was yesterday that he was graduating from kindergarten, um, he got a letter in the mail from one of our saints, Peggy Tingen, and she said, I am going to be praying for you. And you know what? I know she was. And um, we are praying church. And, and, you know, normally you give graduates the charge. Well, we're giving the congregation the charge, and that is to pray for these kids. And um, I know the power, the power of prayer. And last year, Laura stood up here and, and asked you to join her in praying. And God answered her prayer only a way God could answer it. So I know, I know that the power of prayer is alive in this church. Um, so I chose a verse today that's kind of from their Awana, one of their Awana scriptures and um, that we, we talk about each week. And let your word, Lord, be a light or a lamp into their feet and a light into their path. And Lord, we just want to lift them up to you. So let's just bow our heads and let's just pray for these, these graduates. Dear Lord, we just ask that you be with them and that you will guide their steps, Lord, that they will seek you, that they will seek your guidance in their steps in life. 
Lord, that, um, but that you would also guide their paths. Lord, we pray for these friendships these kids are going to be making. Lord, we just pray that they will be the light and the salt for you, Lord. Um, we pray for their education and their protection, and we pray for... Um, we pray just specifically for Eli and for Jazz and for Jameson and Christopher and Michael, Lord, that you will protect them and that you will be with them. Lord, we also just want to lift up um, the Glen Hope community here, Lord, the people that are around us, the church, the schools that we, we serve and that we minister to, Lord, that you will protect them, that you will bring them to Glen Hope, Lord, and that you will just... Lay it on each one of our hearts, Lord, to pray for these students in our community. Lord, we just pray for their safety as they, they celebrate their graduations. But, Lord, we just pray for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. It's been a, a full morning, a good morning, uh, as we have celebrated together and worshiped together to this point. Uh, we are excited now to continue worshiping and feeding on, on God's Word as we continue working through uh, the Gospel of John. And today we'll be in John chapter 7, beginning a few weeks in John chapter 7, uh, talking about uh, this idea, kind of overarching idea throughout the chapter, while he waits. And particularly we'll see Jesus um, today waiting to, to go to Jerusalem for this instance. And overall, we understand Jesus waiting uh, for his ultimate entry into Jerusalem um, the, 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 and the cross and, and resurrection. And, and as we understand the waiting um, for him to ultimately return and establish his, his kingdom, the new heaven and the new earth. So these are the things that we have in mind as we talk about while he waits today. So John chapter 7, verses 1 through 13, is their passage for today. Scripture says, After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. So his brother said to him, Move on from here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works, which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself is striving to be known publicly. If you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. So Jesus said to them, My time is not yet here, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I'm not, I am not going up to this feast because my time has not yet fully arrived. Now having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as though in secret. So the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was a great deal of talk about him in secret among the crowds. Some were saying, he is a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he is misleading the people. However, no one was speaking openly about him for fear of the Jews. Let's pray. Father, we're, we're forever grateful for your word. Grateful that we have the opportunity week after week after week, to make it the highlight of what we do. As we praise you in song, we praise you in prayer, and we praise you in the study of your word. God, I pray that you use your, your word today to, to transform lives, God. We pray, God, for an awakening of our souls, I pray, God, for an awakening. God, if there are spiritually dead people in this place today, or spiritually dead people who view this online, God, that you awaken them, remove the scales of darkness and blindness from their eyes, God, so they can see the light, see the truth 
of who you are. Change their lives, God, for your glory and forever. God, for, for those of us who, who may be sitting here listening today and we are yours and we know it, God, I pray that we are we're changed even more, shaped even more, even more into your image as a result of studying your word together today, God, as only you can, through the power of your Holy Spirit in us, will you shape us and mold us to your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. So today, we're, as we look at this passage, we're going to kind of take a look at it from the view of the people, what, you know, while Jesus is waiting, the, what's going on with the people that are around him at this point? make some application to, to our own lives, people in the world today. And then we're going to take a look at it from the aspect of what's going on with Jesus while he waits. What, what, is, he, what is he looking at? What is he thinking about? What is the purpose of, of him as he waits? So uh, first we'll, we'll see what's going on with the people. And overall, I, I think you, you understand as we read those 13 verses that, that, that people are conflicted about Jesus. People are conflicted about Jesus, and, and the truth is that people have always been and will always be conflicted about who Jesus is. It's, and, it, and it's not simply, there's plenty of people where, where the conflict in their hearts and minds is simply love, love him, hate him, a, a love-hate relationship. And for many people, it's just, uh, you know, straight up hate. And we'll see that with the first group of, of people that we talk about. Uh, but, but for a lot of people in the world, there's also uh, the conflict of, uh, that, that's not as deep emotionally, perhaps. And, and the conflict is, I like him. I, I, I like what he says. I, I like what he stands for. I, I like the, the things that he teaches. But I'm not so much ready, willing, wanting to serve him. And so there's that conflict that, that goes on with people. And I think you'll see some of that as we study through uh, the, the different people that we see in our, in our Scripture today. And so the, the first group of people that, that we get to is right there in verse 1. There, that as we see, Jesus is hanging around Galilee, not going up to Judea, not going up to Jerusalem, because the Jews are seeking to kill him. And so part of the, the conflicted group of people people who are conflicted about Jesus, part of them want to kill him. Th these people literally want to kill Jesus. At, at this point in his ministry, there are always, already people that want to kill him. They, they, it's a black and white issue. It's, it's very simple. It's very clear to them about what needs to be done to Jesus. They need to kill him. And the question, I think, that we have to explore is why do they want to kill him? You know, you could, you could, they want to kill him to, to, to prevent uh, further damage or future damage uh, in, their, in their minds, in their estimation of what's going on with Jesus. They, 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 they're, they're killing him in a preventative type of, of mode. And we're going to explore uh, that damage, what they see as damage in a moment, and how it relates to to why people today want to kill Jesus. And you think, well, Jesus has already been killed, right? He died on the cross, and we know he's alive, right? He resurrected from the grave, and he's alive. But he's not physically present, we understand. And, but there are people, we could say, that want to kill him today. And it ties in with the reason that the people wanted to physically kill him that he's talking about right here in this Scripture passage. The Jews that were seeking to kill him wanted to kill him to, to nip his influence in the bud. He was a threat to them. He was a threat to their position. He was a, a threat to their authority. He was a threat to their way of life. He was a threat to their worldview. Because he certainly and absolutely wanted to wanted to influence the way that they saw the world. 
That's what the Scriptures do. The Scriptures, when you're a follower of Jesus, it influences the way you see the world. And so the, these Jewish people that wanted to kill him wanted to do it for all of those reasons. Because they just needed to take him out of the world because he was influencing their world and the world around them too much. And was having, in their view, a negative impact on their life. And so people today, while not necessarily looking to kill a, physically, a physical Jesus, they are looking to kill the influence of Jesus. Because as we understand, he's very much alive, and his influence continues on in the world around us. His influence continues through the church. His influence continues through the, through the Holy Spirit living in his church and, and, and being active. And so people who want to kill Jesus today want to stop that. They, they, want, to, they want to stop Christians from acting like Christians. And understand that the people, that behind the people who are carrying out these things on the earth is the enemy, is, devil, is the devil, Satan. He's the one that's authoring all this. He's the one that, that, that uses people on the earth to carry out this agenda, to kill Jesus. You see, he's st the devil is still trying to kill him, even though he knows he can't. He knows he can't. And, but he's still trying. And he's trying to do that by killing his influence, killing his character, killing his reputation, these are all the things that he wants to do. He wants to plant in people's minds that, hey, if this, this Jesus, all he wants to do is control your life. This Jesus, all he wants to do is, is make, make you do not what you want to do. You want to live a free life. You want to be able to do whatever you want to do. Jesus doesn't want you to do that. Jesus wants to, to contain you. He wants to make your life miserable. And so that's what the world tries to do, being influenced by the enemy, trying to kill Jesus all over again. We see, we see it take place, in, you know, individually in individual lives. You see it take place in, in, in government levels. You see it take place. One, one, of, the, one of the things that I, I see and hear a lot that, and I think we can all agree with, you know, this idea, uh, lots of times Christians like to talk about, you know, well, they took you know, the world started going, going wrong, going bad, especially the American world, um, when they took Jesus out of schools, right? When they took, when they took God out of the schools, that's when, that's when the world started going bad. And that is a true example, I think, of, of, of trying to kill the influence of Jesus, trying to kill the influence of God in, our, in the world around us. But here's, here's where the application comes to us. And we're going to see these applications throughout what we're talking about today. Because as people try to kill Jesus, try to kill his influence, what are we doing? What are we doing about that, Christians? What are we doing about that, in particular, Glen Hope Christians? Now, I'm going to say something here that, that may, may come across a little hard. But let's talk about that. They took, they're taking Jesus out of the schools. They took Jesus out of the schools. Well, what can we do in response? What we can do in response is, is try to have an influence in the schools. And, we, you, and you guys know that's one of the things we've been trying to do, right? We, we try to we, we have build relationships with Cummings High School, and with feeding the football teams and talking to, to, to them about Jesus before their games. We, we, we try to take things to the teachers and, and, and love on them. We uh, have the, the Esperanza Academy going on, the, the tutoring for, for students uh, to learn English better. We have things like that going on. We got the, the Broadview 8th grade graduation happening right here, right here, Tuesday morning. And so all of these things are, are not just to be nice. They're, they're not just to be, you know, show that we're, good partners with the community. Those, those are things we want to do. We, we want to be nice. We want to be seen as nice and, and, and as loving partners. But the big idea is to show people that Jesus is alive, 
to show people that Jesus is love, to show people the love of Jesus in practical ways and hopefully open the door to gospel conversations. That when people start to think about Jesus, and guys, every person on this earth will think about Jesus, will have to think about Jesus at some point. They're going to. And we want them to think about the way that we treated them. We want them to think about good examples. And so we have all of these opportunities to, in some form or fashion, get Jesus back in the school. Even though, as Christians, we often complain they take Jesus out of school. We have opportunities here at Glen Hope to put Jesus back in the school. And you should be excited about that. Because I know many of you probably do complain about that, right? Complain about Jesus being taken out of school. You, you see it as a real problem. And so here's where the hard part comes. If you see it as an issue, you see it as a problem, and you see that we have opportunities to put Jesus back, and we've been asking for volunteers for, for three weeks now to come help with Tuesday morning, and we got four volunteers. Is it important to you, is it important as you say, when you say they took Jesus out of the schools, and now we got opportunities to put Jesus back in the school, but you ain't here? The same people feed the football team. The same people do, do, do all the things. Where are you? Is it important to you? Well, I have to, you know, I work. How important is Jesus to you that you can't give two hours of your personal time? To come and serve and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Well, but then that takes away from my vacation. Yeah. How important is Jesus to you to perhaps give two hours of your vacation time to serve? Because I really, I've never talked to you. I don't, I don't think in four years I've talked to you like that. But man, we got we, we to gotta get out of a malaise. We can't think that we've arrived because we got a lot of things going. Man, we got a lot of stuff going on. We always have a lot of stuff going on. And by and large, man, you, you guys do great. There, there, there's a group of you that, that serves and serves and serves, but more of us need to serve. More of us need to be at work be in the hands and feet of Jesus because the world is trying to kill him. And we're just sitting in our cubicles or we're just sitting on our couch while the world kills him. The world kills his influence and we just sit and watch and complain about it. We have opportunities to do something about it. Now stop keeping your mouth shut and say, amen, we're going to do something about it. Let's do something about it. We have opportunities to do something about it. And I pray that on Tuesday morning, I see some people that I've never seen come out and volunteer. I pray that you're taking seriously this truth that the world is trying to kill Jesus still. And it's not for us just to sit by and watch it. It's for us to stand up and do something about it. So hear that hard truth, church. I deliver it with love because I know who you are. I know the depths of your heart and your spirit, but sometimes we got to be shaken a little bit. But let's see the truth of what the world is trying to do. They're trying to kill him, trying to kill him again, trying to kill his influence. we got to do something about it. There's another group of people that we see and they doubt him. Another way that people in the world are conflicted about Jesus is they doubt him. And this particular group in this scripture are Jesus' brothers, his half-brothers, the, the, the children of, of Mary and, and Joseph that, that have been born to, to them. And, and we see that they're having this, this, this conversation with Jesus and, and, and they're doubting his true calling as Messiah is really what's going on here. And, and you see that either what's going on, they're, they're either mocking him or it's just a misunderstanding of his true call. And, and I, I, tend to, I tend to think that it's a, a misunderstanding of, of his true calling. But either way, whether they're mocking him or whether it's a, a misunderstanding, it's because they are doubting 
his true call. And so you, you see what, what, what goes on here is that the, they're saying to him, listen, we've seen that many of your disciples have left. Remember uh, last week we talked about those false disciples, right? And many of the false disciples disassoci- disassociated with Jesus. And so these people that have been following him around, some started to, 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 to go away after, you know, the, the hard word that he delivered and it was hard for them to understand. It was distasteful in their minds. And so they, they had started to, to go away. And Jesus' brothers saw this. And because of their misunderstanding of his true call, because in their minds, you know, well, listen, you know, this is, this is our brother, right? We, we, we haven't seen anything really special about him. Yeah, he never gets in trouble, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, he, he never messes up. He, he never gets mad at mom and dad. He, he, you know, he's perfect, but whatever. But they don't see him as Messiah. What they see him at, and, and I think what they're alluding to here is, you know, maybe he's going to be, you know, kind of a, a, a popular religious leader of our day. And he'll have some, some influence on, on people of our time and you know, if he if he keeps a if he keeps a, a following, um, then maybe we even get some influence. Maybe we even get some uh, something off of that. And so, what they're suggesting to him is, "Hey, listen, if you want to get some get some more disciples, if you want to grow your following again after you've lost some, maybe you should go up to the, to the to the feast of booths. Maybe you should go up to Jerusalem and do some of your some of the miracles you've been doing. Do some of the." whether it's miracles or whether it's tricks or however they're viewing it, do some of the things you've been doing and that big crowd of people there, surely there's some people that, that are going to follow you. And once they start following you, we will uh, be able to, to grow the group again. And maybe, maybe they'll, you know, give us some influence. Maybe they'll give us food. Maybe, you know, that, I think that's the way the brothers are thinking. And you know, their, 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 their whole goal here is just to, hey, let, let's get you in front of a better crowd. We got to get you in front of some different people. And then you'll get some more disciples. But all of that, the point of this is that they're driven into thinking that way because they doubt that he's the Messiah. They doubt that he's King Jesus. They doubt that he's God. They doubt the, the, the whole truth about who he is. And this kind of ties in with what, what Pastor Kevin led us through in our call to worship. You know, in, in, in asking that question, who do you say he is? Because in many of our minds, in, in the minds of people, who we say he is is driven by doubt. There may be folks who doubt that he is King Jesus, doubt that he is God, doubt that he wants to be the Lord of your life. Maybe you doubt that he can forgive you for what you've done. Maybe you doubt that he can can help lift you out of the sin that you're caught in. Maybe you doubt that he could ever love someone like you. And so your, your, your response to him, your relationship with him is driven by doubt instead of driven by belief that he is who he says he is and he can be that even to you. And so, and so learn from his brothers and not be driven by doubt. Perhaps as they doubted the Father's call on his life, perhaps you're doubting his call on your life. Perhaps you, you, perhaps you, 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 you sense or you sense strongly that, 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 that God has called you to, to something. God has called you to, to serve. God has called you to, 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 to make a move. God has called you, wherever it is he's calling you. But you're doubting his power. You're doubting his presence. You're doubting the veracity of his call in your life. And you just need to believe. You just need to believe his truth. You need to believe that he is truth and believe his call on your life. 
So I encourage you to stop doubting him today and start following him. The last group of people that we see that are conflicted about him are, are those who are divided over him. We see in verses 11 and 12 that the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? There was a great deal of talk about him in secret among the crowd. Some were saying he is a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he is misleading the people. However, no one was speaking openly about him for fear of the Jews. And so then, as now, people are divided. And again, Pastor Kevin got into this a little bit. But, you know, the, it, who is he? Is he a good teacher? Some will say he's a good teacher. He is a prophet, a good man, a moral man. There, there's, you know, a lot of people like that. He existed, yeah, but, you know, God, I don't know. Then there are others, like us, say, hey, he's, he's God. He, he's, he's, he's king. He's Savior. He's Lord. And you need to know him. And then there's people still in this world who's like, he's nothing. He doesn't exist. He never existed. And so then as now, people are divided over who he is. And, and, and the big, I think the big application for us is, is to, for us, with the teaching that we have and with the scriptures that we have in front of us, that we can, we can rest assured and, and stand, not, not be divided in our own minds about who he is. There, there's no reason as, as people of faith that we should have questions about who he is. There should be no division in our minds. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we, we, we dig into the word and we understand better and we understand more deeply who he is and there's no division in your own heart and in your own mind. You can, you can rest assured and stand secure on who he is based on the word of God. And so this is a call, this, this idea of being divided over him, this is a call to the scriptures. Because the only way that we, stand divide, that we stand not divided, that we stand assured about who he is, it's not through our own conscience. It's not through our own ability to understand. It's not through our own logic. It's by faith. It's by faith. You've been given the gift of faith. And so you exercise that faith. And we exercise that faith by studying the Word of God. And when we study the Word, the Word of God, we go deeper into this place of having no division in our hearts and minds about who Jesus is and who He wants to be in our lives. No division. No doubts. Not seeking to kill him, but seeking to hold him up as alive and hold his influence up as the greatest influence in our own lives and should be the greatest influence in everyone's lives around us. That's what we pray for. That's what we shoot for. That's what we work for. Now let's shift gears for a few minutes and see what Jesus is doing here. What is Jesus, what are we learning from Jesus while he waits? And overall, we see the idea that he's waiting for the perfect time. In the verses that, that, that we've read in verses 1 through 13, we see Jesus waiting for the perfect time. Surely you noticed, as we were reading this scripture, that, you know, Jesus' brothers say, hey, you know, why don't you go up and get some more disciples? And Jesus says, nah, I'm not going. You go on, but I'm not going. And then in the next breath, what does Jesus do? Seemingly in the next breath, what does he do? He goes. He goes, but you know, I'm like mind blown. You know, what is Jesus, what's up with Jesus here? He says, "I'm not going," and then in the next verse, he goes. So, so what's up with that? Uh, let's get that straight first. You know, when when he when he says to uh, his his brothers that he's not, go you go. I'm not going. What he's meaning is, I'm not going right now. I'm not going right now, and we understand that as we continue reading. Because he says, I'm not going right now because it's not time for me to go right now. So that leaves the door open for, for, the, for the fact that there will be a time for him to go. And that time is the perfect time. And we understand that uh, uh, in Galatians 4.4, 4, it kind of uh, 
sheds insight on this, that that's the way the Godhead works. That's the way the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit works is in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, God sent his Son. In the fullness of time, God created. In the fullness of time, God went to the cross. In the fullness of time, he rose from the dead. In the fullness of time, he saved you or will save you. In the fullness of time, he'll come back and reestablish and establish a new heaven and the new earth. So in the fullness of time is the way that the Godhead works. In the fullness of time is, the, is all Jesus knows. It's all he knows. And so he says to his brothers, essentially, not now, but in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, I will go. And that fullness of time is to be known and understood as the perfect time. And the perfect time for Jesus involves his perfect obedience to carrying out the perfect will of the Father. That's when the perfect time is. The perfect time is when he is perfectly obedient to the perfect will of the Father. And so he says to his brothers, check out what he says to his brothers. He says, you can go because you're of the world. At this time, his brothers weren't believers, right? His brothers didn't see him as God. His brothers didn't understand him to be God. And they were very much of the world, as Jesus said. And so because they were of the world, they didn't have to listen for God. They didn't have to be, be, be worried about God's obe being obe obedient to God and being obedient to his perfect timing and being obedient to his will because they were of the world. So God didn't matter to them. God's timing didn't matter to them. But Jesus says, I'm not of the world. And so here's an application for us, right? If you, are, if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, guess what? You're not of the world. So you can't just go willy-nilly and do things. you gotta, you got to hear from your Father. God, is this of your will? And this is, is this the time? for me to, to carry out what you're calling me to. We, 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 can't, we can't just go and we got to hear from our Father on every move, on every decision that we make. Hearing from our Father so that we're sure that we're walking in His will. So, so these brothers of His didn't have to wait on guidance from the Father, but Jesus had to. Jesus was waiting for guidance from the Father in that particular instance. Right? He's waiting for guidance from the Father on when it, what, when it was that he was to go to Judea, go, go to Jerusalem for this festiv festival of booths, how it was that he was to go, and we see that he went in secret. He, he, he didn't go to 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 get some more disciples like his brothers thought he ought to do. He went in secret. But, but he waited on the Father for that perfect timing in that instance. And we extrapolate then and, and we look and we understand that Jesus also waited on the Father for the perfect time for the ultimate entry, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That's going to happen a little bit later. But he waited on the perfect time for that. He waited on the perfect time to go to the cross. The perfect time, as we talked about, for resurrection. And he's waiting on the perfect time, the ultimate time, to return and claim those who are his. And so Jesus is always obediently waiting on the Father for the perfect time to carry out his perfect will. So why does Jesus do this? Why does Jesus do this? One, it shows us who he is. It shows us that, that he, in fact, is God. In, in, in his godness. Remember, we, we, we believe the Bible teaches that, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. So in his 
full godness, it makes sense then that he's going to be perfectly obedient. That he's going to, that he's going to do everything that, that, the, that the, the Godhead has set out to do. And he's going to do it in, in the, at the perfect time and in the perfect way and in the right way. So it gives evidence that he is God. But at the same time, in his humanity, it's a model for us. It's a model for us. Because, you know, we're, we might be thinking, well, it's easy for him to, to be perfectly obedient and do things when, when, when the Father wants him to do because, after all, he's God. You know, it's easy for me to do what I want to do, right? It's easy for you to do what you want to do. It's easy for you to, to say, all right, I'm going to the grocery store at 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock comes, you go. Might not be as easy to remember what I need to get at the grocery store. But you get what I'm saying, all right? It's easy to do what you're going to do. But that's why it's important that we understand that Jesus is also fully human. And in his humanity, he shows perfect obedience to the will of God. He shows perfect obedience to the perfect will of God and carrying it out at the perfect timing. And so he's a model for us in that. Because we understand that in his humanity, he could have sinned, but he didn't. In his humanity, he could have pushed back on God's plan. He could have pushed back on God's will, but he didn't. In his humanity, he could have said, God, I hear you. I hear that you want me to go up to Jerusalem later. But you know what? I think it's just easier for me to go with my brothers. You seen the prices of gas lately? Let me just ride with my brothers. It's good for me to carpool with them. Even though you're telling me to go a little bit later and go in secret, nah, I'm going to go now. But in his humanity, he didn't do that. Would have been easy for me and you to do that probably, to respond that way, even though God is clearly perhaps leading us a different way. And that's the point of this, that we are to understand that Jesus could have reacted and responded like we do a lot of times. Not according to God's will, but according to our own way. And ultimately, comes under the influence of the enemy. And so we want to see from Jesus in his full humanity a model for being obedient for being perfectly obedient to the Father's perfect will. And I submit to you, there's no better place to be. There's no safer place to be. Do you you understand? God's will is perfect. It's perfect. My will is not. Your will is not. My plan is not perfect. Your plan is not perfect. But God's plan is perfect. And so when, when, when you sit here and you hear that and we think about it logically, you got to be asking, like I'm asking in my head right now, why in the world would I ever do anything different? Why in the world do I ever go my own way? When I have a father who has a perfect plan for me and a perfect timing for carrying out that plan, why do I ever make a move outside of that? Why do I ever make a decision that's outside of his perfect plan and his perfect timing? That, that, that is the question, I think, for us. And so, while he waits, what are you doing? While he waits for the perfect time, for the fullness of time to return, establish his new heaven and his new earth, his kingdom. What are you doing? Doubting him? Are you divided over him? Are you obedient to his perfect will, his perfect timing? seeking to kill him. 
trust there's not many people here who would fall in that category. But as I said earlier, what are we doing to stand against those who are seeking to kill him? To kill his influence. While he waits, what are you doing? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the perfect model of obedience to you, who is Jesus. Thank you, God, that that we can learn from him, be influenced by him in his humanity and worship him in his godness. God, I pray that our lives as believers, as disciples of Jesus, have a trajectory of growth in that, of maturity. I pray, God, for for anyone here or listening who or viewing who is not a believer. I pray, God, that they hear truth today and they take steps to say, yes, I want to be a, a follower of Jesus. I understand that I don't need to doubt him. I don't need to doubt his power to save me, even me, from my sin, to, to forgive me for my sin and draw me unto him. I, I don't doubt that anymore. God, will you you make that truth loud and clear to, to, to multiple people who are hearing this today and move them then to follow you by publicly identifying with you, being baptized and being a follower of Jesus Christ, God. Will you move? Will you move in their hearts, God, in ways that that we can only explain by saying, that's Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit at work. That's supernatural. Never saw that coming. God, will you do it as only you can? And will you move your people then, God, to represent you loud and clear in this world that seeks to kill your influence, seeks to kill your reputation, seeks to kill everything about you, God? Let us respond in the way that is biblical and in a way, God, that brings glory to you and your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.